Of war I sing. War worse than civil. Waged over the plains of Amathia and of legality conferred on crime. I tell how an imperial people turned their victorious right hands against their own vitals. How kindred fought against kindred. How, when the compact of tyranny was shattered, all the forces of the shaken world contended to make mankind guilty. How standards confronted hostile standards. Eagles were matched against each other, and Pilum threatened Pilum. What madness was this, my countrymen? What fierce orgy of slaughter? While the ghost of Crassus still wandered unavenged, and it was your duty to rob proud Babylon of her trophies over Italy, did you choose to give two hated nations the spectacle of Roman bloodshed and to wage wars that could win no triumphs? Ah, with that blood shed by Roman hands, how much of earth and sea might have been bought, where the sun rises and where night hides the stars, where the south is parched with burning airs, and where the rigor of winter that no spring can thaw binds the Scythian sea with icy cold. Ere this, the Chinese might have passed under our yoke, and the savage Araxes, and any nation that knows the secret of Nile's cradle. If Rome has such a lust for unlawful warfare, let her first subdue the whole earth to her sway, and then commit self-slaughter. Rivalry in worth spurred them on. For Magnus feared that fresher exploits might dim his past triumphs, and that his victory over the pirates might give place to the conquest of Gaul. While Caesar was urged on by continuous effort and familiarity with warfare, and by fortune that brooked no second place, Caesar could no longer endure a superior, nor Pompey an equal. Which had the fairer pretext for warfare, we may not know. The two rivals were ill-matched. The one was somewhat tamed by declining years. For long he had worn the toga and forgotten in peace the leader's part. Courting reputation and lavish to the common people, he was swayed entirely by the breath of popularity and delighted in the applause that hailed him in the theater he built. And trusting fondly to his former greatness, he did nothing to support it by fresh power. The mere shadow of a mighty name he stood. Thus an oak tree, laden with the ancient trophies of a nation and the consecrated gifts of conquerors, towers in a fruitful field. But the roots it clings by have lost their toughness, and it stands by its weight alone, throwing out bare boughs into the sky and making a shade not with leaves, but with its trunk. Though it totters, doomed to fall at the first gale, while many trees with sound timber rise beside it, yet it alone is worshipped. But Caesar had more than a mere name and military reputation. His energy could never rest, and his one disgrace was to conquer without war. He was alert and headstrong. His arms answered every summons of ambition or resentment. He never shrank from using the sword lightly. He followed up each success and snatched at the favor of fortune, overthrowing every obstacle on his path to supreme power, and rejoicing to clear the way before him by destruction. Even so, the lightning is driven forth by wind through the clouds, with noise of the smitten heaven, and crashing of the firmament, it flashes out and cracks the daylight sky, striking fear and terror into mankind and dazzling the eye with slanting flame. It rushes to its appointed quarter of the sky, nor can any solid matter forbid its free course, but both falling and returning it spreads destruction far and wide and gathers again its scattered fires. Such were the motives of the leaders.